Hi, and welcome to this CLE presentation of really an introduction to the NIL world. Of course, NIL is uh, really what we're looking at, the college landscape that allows collegiate athletes to capitalize on their name, image, and likeness rights. My name is Brandon Leopoldis. I'm a lawyer based in Los Angeles and primarily working with those in the sports industry. Um, that ranges everything from high school transfer situations with the California Interscholastic Federation, all the way through Hall of Famers, uh, teams, leagues, you name it. Uh, if it involves the sports world, we're probably going to be involved. One of the really fun things that we've had uh, going on at our practice since 2021 has been these NIL deals. And we're going to get into what the nuts and bolts of those agreements look like, what's required in some of those agreements, the good, the bad, the ugly. But I think it's also important to understand where we've come from and where we're going. So that way we can understand what that actual landscape looks like. This is a really interesting area of law. Um, and honestly, it's an area of sports law that while it's a competitive industry to get into, I think a lot of young lawyers are going to have the opportunity to work in this industry simply because they're able to have some access to these collegiate athletes a lot quicker and a lot faster uh, than say somebody I would who's not on a college campus or I'm a little further removed from a college campus. And even though I work with uh, NIL companies and some individual uh, uh, individual athletes and brands that are working in that space, it's really, really interesting when you start to look at the vast uh, majority of lawyers working in the space are a lot younger than me, have a lot less experience than me, but uh, they're doing really cool things. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun uh, moving forward. So uh, let's jump into it a little bit. Um, what we're talking about are these collegiate athletes that are playing at an NCAA member institution. And when we start talking about that, um, we need to know what the NCAA is and uh, what those member institutions actually look like. So um, let's jump into the history of the NCAA a little bit. Now, we've been playing collegiate sports for a really long time. Um, that It's, uh, you know, back on campus with leather helmets uh, and those type of things with football um, back in the early, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. And it, the NCAA was founded in about 1906 to, uh, quote, regulate the rules of collegiate sports and protect young athletes. And this uh, arose because back in uh, a few years prior to that, um, they had a lot of uh, really significant injuries. What we saw as significant injuries at the time with uh, 18 players dying from their injuries in uh, interscholastic football and 159 other serious injuries. Now, what uh, may be a serious injury then compared to now are two different things, of course. Um, so that's, that's uh, something to take a look at um, when we're taking uh, a look in the history of the NCAA. But back then, that was a serious issue. And at the time, some schools were filling their rosters, right? They were padding them with players who were not necessarily students at the school, right? They were paying outside athletes from around the area that they thought could give their school a leg up, right? Uh, the spirit of competition, win at all costs. And so schools were paying some players um, that really just weren't part of their campus, right? They weren't attending the school. They weren't uh, teaching at the school. They were just uh, uh, some local ringers. And so after uh, World War II, the NCAA instituted what they called the Sanity Code. The Sanity Code uh, permitted covered financial aid for um, those student athletes and established recruitment and academic standards. Um, all of it was in furtherance of what we called amateurism in collegiate athletics. It, what it really tried to do was um, give a, a, a baseline and a requirement of what they could and could not do, right? Just like teams and leagues have re requirements for their participation in that league. Um, here, the NCAA just tried to put in some common factors to try and level the playing field. And then if you were going to be a better recruiter than the other, if you were going to have better coaching, if you were going to have better athletes, then so be it. But that was in the spirit of competition. And of course, in 1980, in response to Title IX being enacted, the NCAA put 10 uh, women's sports for, up for championship interscholastic competition. A lot of uh, really good things came out of Title IX that continue those ripple effects today, um, whether it's uh, some women going to college that otherwise couldn't uh, uh, attend college simply because uh, they didn't have the financial